the Xeno series, my favorite game series of all time. This series is the biggest reason I am into as many JRPGs as I am today, but nothing really beats it for me. Rune Factory may have been the beginning, but Xenoblade was what made me grow such an affinity towards the genre. It all started with a certain Let's Play YouTuber who made a very detailed playthrough on Xenoblade 1. At the time, I didn't really know anything about Xenoblade Chronicles, but I was intrigued. So I bought a new 3DS XL, Xenoblade 3D, and the rest is history. But today, we are not here to talk about the first Xenoblade game. The reason is, it isn't the first entry in this beloved series. Far from it, in fact. On top of this, I want there to be more coverage on Xenogears and Xenosaga as a whole. More Xenoblade fans need to play these games. They stand right up there with Xenoblade as well. The characters and stories contained within these early works of Tetsuya Takahashi, as well as everyone else involved with these projects, is nothing short of remarkable. They must be discussed more than they are currently. So where's a good place to start? The development. Xenogears in particular has a very interesting history behind its development, and I thought it would be a good idea to start there. All the information I am about to discuss will be from various articles surrounding Xenogears development and localization, and why it is a miracle that this game was ever released in any finished state or even localized at all. Back in the early 1990s, Squaresoft was developing Final Fantasy IV. At that time, Tetsuya Takahashi joined the team to work as an artist for the game, working under the creator of the series, Hironobu Sakaguchi. Sakaguchi was impressed with Takahashi's work, as he was someone who went above and beyond and put much attention to detail when creating artwork for Final Fantasy. Squaresoft at one point was split into three groups, the Final Fantasy team, Saga team, and Mana team one team for each respective franchise. Takahashi ended up working in the Final Fantasy team, becoming somewhat of a mentor to the young designer at the time, Tetsuya Nomura, which you may know today for creating some of the iconic Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy character designs. Eventually, he also made the character designs for Xenoblade 2's Torna group. One of Takahashi's accomplishments early on was his work on the opening sequence in Final Fantasy VI, and during the development of that game, Takahashi worked alongside Kaori Tanaka, who worked on the character backstories for Edgar and Sabin. Once Final Fantasy VI was finished, Takahashi went on to work on Front Mission and Chrono Trigger, whereas Tanaka went to work on the Saga team to help with Romance and Saga 3, designing world maps and character artwork. While this was happening, Takahashi and Tanaka became romantically involved with one another, and eventually married. Once this happened, this is where Xenogears truly began. Before we get to that, did you know that the original concept for Xenogears was first pitched to be the story concept for Final Fantasy VII? While Tanaka tried to pitch the idea of a young soldier with multiple personalities to higher-ups at Square, and she was denied. They believed that it was too dark and complicated for a Final Fantasy game. Not only did this happen, but Takahashi did not approve of how Final Fantasy VII went about its world design. They were using pre-rendered backgrounds as the game's environments, which Takahashi felt wasn't the way to go. He preferred that they would go for full 3D environments instead, now that the technology was there to support it. Because of his personal disagreements with the team for Final Fantasy VII, he seeked assistance from Sakaguchi, asking if he could work on a different project from Final Fantasy. So, Sakaguchi went on to put Takahashi in charge to a potential sequel to Chrono Trigger. This didn't go well, unfortunately, seeing as the actual sequel to Chrono Trigger wouldn't start until a few years later. So what did this project turn into after all? Project Noah was the name. This was a collaborative effort between Takahashi and Tanaka, and some of the inspiration for this project was philosophical literature from people such as Nietzsche, Freud, and Carl Jung. Both Tanaka and Takahashi had a passion for philosophy, and it was based on the original pitch that was for Final Fantasy VII, but now is going to become their own project. This story would go on to tackle complex themes such as artificial intelligence, origin and the future of mankind, love, and more. Project Noah was, in every sense of the word, an epic that takes place over the course of 15 billion years. The original idea was to present the beginning of this story with a video game, and then produce the rest in other forms of media. I want to emphasize that this wasn't just Takahashi doing this all alone. Tanaka helped with many of the elements of Project Noah, and wouldn't be the same without her. 
Now that you see how massive the scope of this project truly was back then, who else was involved with this project, and how exactly was it going to get done? Well, clearly they weren't alone in this overly ambitious project. Chrono Trigger composer Yasunori Mitsuda would compose the game's soundtrack, character designer Kunihiko Tanaka and art director Yatsuyuki Han would contribute to this project as well. Within Squaresoft, this project attracted much attention from talent within the company, likely since the initial ideas for this project were larger in scope than ever before. Another passion that Takahashi developed around this time was mechs. In an Iwata Asks interview, Sakaguchi mentions how right after this separate team was formed to work on Project Noah, Takahashi's desk was full of Gundam models. So alongside the deep and philosophical story elements, there would be mechs in this game as well. As you may have guessed, the mechs were called Gears, and Xeno in the title was meant to describe something that was alien and different. So then the project went from Project Noah to Xenogears. One aspect I'd like to bring up is that mechs and JRPGs were not a common trait, especially back in the mid-90s. Obviously, seeing as mecha anime were pretty popular back then, a notable example being Neon Genesis Evangelion, you'd think that JRPGs and mechs would go hand in hand, but Xenogears was likely one of the first JRPGs to do this sort of thing, which certainly made it stand out from the rest of the JRPGs at the time. Remember how Takahashi disagreed with the decision to have FF7 use pre-rendered backgrounds? Well, in Xenogears, he decided to go with the exact opposite approach that they went with, making all environments be in 3D, even if they didn't have the budget nor resources to do it very effectively. You can also control the camera in Xenogears, whereas FF7 didn't. Unfortunately, the Xenogears team didn't have a ton of time to finish this project to its fullest. Not only were they only given a year and a half, but Xenogears did not receive the budget and resources that, say, FF7 did. The staff that Takahashi had to work with weren't experienced with 3D graphics, which made sense, since 2D sprites and backgrounds were basically the norm for JRPGs at the time. But the Xenogears team pressed on anyways, despite the hurdles that had to be overcome with learning 3D graphics. Takahashi was ambitious to a fault. Seeing as throughout its development, the world and scope kept getting larger, so what was planned as a single disc endeavor turned into two discs, and there wasn't nearly enough time to properly finish disc 2. The higher-ups at Square proposed the idea of cutting the game short and ending it at disc 1. If you played Xenogears, you know this would have been a really bad idea. So Takahashi did not want to do this, and instead tried to find an alternate way of finishing the game. So. The game became essentially a visual novel throughout most of Disc 2. Instead of playing out story events and going through each dungeon slash boss fight in full, the game explained many of the story elements with walls of text with the character most involved with the plot point explaining it while sitting in a chair. To many, this was bizarre to say the least, so a lot of initial reception of Xenogears was confusion and hope for what was to come. Seeing as at the end of the game, the real title of the game was revealed to be Xenogears Episode 5. This was only a part of a much larger project Takahashi had planned as we established beforehand. As you might be able to tell from everything said so far, Xenogears development was a difficult and arduous process. The original team was shocked that the game ever released in any finished state at all. But did it perform well sales-wise? Well, the game sold roughly 900,000 copies, which was pretty good, but not nearly enough for the higher-ups at Square, so the Xenogears sequel Takahashi had planned had to be cancelled. Since Takahashi couldn't complete his original vision with Squaresoft, he left the company and went on to create his own company as we now know as Monolith Soft. But that's for another day, another review. Unsurprisingly, it wasn't just the development of the game that was difficult to finish. The localization over in the west was also difficult. Reason is that, there was only one person who did the bulk of the work on translating this game. Since the others who were assigned to work on Xenogears were intimidated with how to go about dealing with the controversial religious references, as well as the dense philosophical references that were challenging to convey through translation. So because of this, the other people who were assigned to translate Xenogears left for other projects to work on. Then it came down to just one person, Richard Honeywood. In interviews done with Honeywood, he explains how difficult it was to get the game translated on time. By himself, he had to direct, translate, and even program parts of the game. 
One of the most difficult parts of translating games like Xenogears that have lots of text in them is that you can't change the number of text boxes or the size of them, which is a problem because in the Japanese language, you can convey much more information with Japanese characters than English characters, meaning some information or plot nuance can be lost because of the differences in languages. Honeywood had to work around the clock and oftentimes just slept at the office, for months. On top of these struggles, he was at odds with some of the elders with his religion due to the content of Xenogears. Honeywood cared a lot about keeping the original vision the same as the Japanese version, but even the non-controversial parts of the story were difficult, such as the aforementioned philosophical concepts. Even to this day, he wonders how he even managed to finish it at all, carrying a similar sentiment to the Xenogears team at Squaresoft. He believes the game would be a very different game given the tools and knowledge he had gained since Xenogears was localized. Because of the absolute nightmare Xenogears was to localize, this was an opportunity for improvement. Editors were assigned to the translation projects from now on, and Xenogears was the first game in which the localization team and the Xenogears development team collaborated together. Honeywood thought that the Xenogears team believed he was a failure. But through the hardships Honeywood faced with the localization, the Xenogears team respected what he had accomplished and insisted on working with him again for future projects such as Chrono Cross and Final Fantasy XI. Now with that Xenogears history lesson out of the way, let's get into why I believe you should try out this game. Before I sat down and played through Xenogears, I feel I shared a pretty common sentiment to others in regards to expectations going into this game. This is the first entry in the series, and it's probably not as good story-wise as the Xenoblade games. And not only that, but its gameplay is probably really outdated since it's a PlayStation game from 1998, so how good could it possibly be? If you felt this way, I did too, but I must emphasize that you really should give this game a shot. I've said it before and I will say it again. This game stands up there alongside the Xenoblade games, especially with the story and the characters. There are even a lot of references and parallels with Xenogears tied to the newer Xenoblade games. In fact, I feel this game is perfect for you if you really like Xenoblade 2, since there is a lot of similarities with the themes presented in both games, but generally, if you love Xenoblade, you will also love Xenogears. If you are intrigued by Xenogears, now that I have explained the, the history and a few of its core elements, then that's great! But how do you go about playing it? Well, thankfully, since Sony hasn't pulled the PlayStation stores from the P PS3 and PS Vita yet, you can still buy it as a PS1 classic, or if you manage to get your hands on a physical copy for a decent price somehow. I bought one, but it was expensive, even if it may be in great condition. I'm very happy to finally have it in my collection, though. However, in my opinion, both of these methods of playing the game is fine, and is technically the original way to play it, but personally, you may find yourself getting frustrated at certain points in the game, or perhaps the tech speed is just far too slow for your liking. Well, this is where emulation comes in. Yes, I know emulation can be a divisive topic to some, but for games like Xenogears, there are ways to improve the game to make your experience more enjoyable. For instance, Safe states are a godsend, especially for difficult boss fights. Having to re-watch cutscenes before a boss fight can get really tiring, or failing to make a jump in a dungeon can lead you to wanting to throw your controller at a wall. But with save states, this can make getting through these parts a lot more bearable. Not only that, but faster tech speed mods exist, which is very nice to have, especially since the original tech speed is so slow. And of course, filters and resolution scalers to improve the visuals are nice to have as well. Generally, I recommend emulating above all other methods of playing this particular game because of some of its shortcomings that can cause people to drop it midway through. Oh, and another word of advice, use guides. I used a game FAQ's guide for every boss in this game, and it was very useful for certain boss fights that just didn't make any sense to me initially. Also, try to use guides for certain dungeons that can be hard to navigate. Okay, you get the point. Hopefully you are convinced to play this game. If not, then at least watch a cutscene compilation to experience the story. 
I did this at first, and even though it does work decently well, you miss out on some interesting lore surrounding various NPCs and some world building, so I'd still recommend playing it yourself. Now that I've sold you on the game, or you've already played it, let's talk about the game's battle system and general exploration. So if you've played the Xenoblade games, you'll know that the combat in each game is pretty deep, provides lots of customization and strategy, all while being very satisfying and rewarding. But how does Xenogears hold up? Better than you'd think, actually. It is turn-based, and starting with ground combat, in each turn you input a string of attacks, your options being each face button with circle being canceling your attacks. You are limited to how many attacks you can do per turn because of the AP system. You start with 3 AP, then by the end of the game you have 7. Triangle attacks use 1 AP, Square uses 2 AP, and X uses 3. So you can experiment to see which combination does the most damage, and sometimes only one type of input works against an enemy. But there's more. Death Bows are the best mechanic of the battle system. If you hit certain buttons enough times, you can learn Death Blows, which is a specific string of inputs that turn into a strong attack that does much more damage than regular attacks. Most party members have a variety of them, and it is very much worth learning as many as you can. I really do love the attention to detail with the sprite animations for each death blow, as well as the sound effects. It's nothing revolutionary, but it's enjoyable even if some death blow animations can get a little old after a while. I personally used a guide and learned them through inputting the exact strand of inputs until I learned the death blow. Another function of ground combat is the combo system. For every AP you don't use on a turn, the AP gets stored. If you build up enough AP by only using a triangle input on each turn, you can build up a max of 28 AP. With this, you can go to the combo menu and string a combo of death blows together. I didn't use this feature that often in the game, but it was so satisfying to pull off huge combos. I remember the boss fights that were the most useful were Ramses and Redrum. You also have spells called Arcane Abilities. I didn't use these that often, with the exceptions of healing party members. Overall, ground combat I found to be pretty enjoyable despite being fairly basic. It works. Now for gear combat. In gears you don't have AP, you just do one attack per turn. The only way to input more than once is when you use gear death blows. The way gear death blows work in this game is by raising your attack level. You start at zero at the beginning of battle, and in order to raise it you must do a normal attack first. Afterwards, you unlock attack level 1, and now you can use death blows with the triangle input. If you do 2 or 3 normal attacks in a row, you can get to attack level 2 and 3, and perform level 2 and 3 death blows. Seems fairly straightforward, right? Well, the main thing you need to watch out for is your fuel. Each gear has a limited amount of fuel, and of course death blows use more fuel, so you do have to be careful with how much fuel you use, especially since some bosses have large amounts of health, or you have to do multiple bosses one after another. Later in the game, you get powered up gears called Omni Gears, and those can go into Hyper Attack Mode, where you can use Hyper Death Blows. The way to get into Hyper Mode is to get to Attack Level 3 and then use X Attacks until you reach Hyper Mode. It lasts a few turns and takes some luck to enter Hyper Mode, but for some bosses later, it's very necessary. One point of advice, UPGRADE YOUR GEARS! If you don't upgrade your gears and keep up with the newest gear equipment that you can buy from gear shops, you will be in a world of pain. So please, please, make sure you have the best parts equipped to your gear. I learned this lesson back when an early game boss fight called Calamity kicked my ass multiple times and I needed to get better gear parts. Speaking of boss fights, let's talk about this game's difficulty. If you keep up with the best equipment at all times, most of the boss fights in this game shouldn't give you too much trouble. But I'm not saying there isn't hard fights, there certainly is. The aforementioned Calamity boss fight was my first real challenge, and Redrum in the sewer section of this game is really tough if you get unlucky and it uses its one-hit KO attack on you frequently. Some boss fights can be very frustrating if you don't have a guide open. One boss fight in particular had the silliest gimmick of them all. The giant wells here is only damaged by this gear and only its square attacks. No other attacks work, you'd be tricked into thinking this boss fight is impossible without looking up a guide, or just so happen to use a square attack with this one gear. 
The boss that gave me by far the most trouble was Opiomorph, a boss in Disc 2. You have to fight an already tough boss before it, with no refuel when given to you for the second fight. It took me a lot of tries, and there wasn't much room for error. Makes sense that a late game boss is strong, but darn, I was surprised it was as hard as it was. Overall, the game isn't too difficult for the most part, but some bosses can and will be surprise challenges you wouldn't expect. Now, let's get into a topic that is somewhat controversial. This game's enemy encounters are all random. Now, before I played this game, I did not like random encounters and thought it was a bad system, which is why it took me so long to give this game a shot, but after playing through this game, I realized something. Random encounters are not that bad. Now, don't get me wrong, I much prefer being able to avoid or run into monsters by seeing them on the field like in most modern JRPGs, but overall, it's fine. It can get annoying at times, especially if you're lost or you're trying to make tricky jumps in a dungeon, but I do not believe it made this game unplayable. Plus, I love the glass shatter and transition and the first few notes of the battle theme, it's so iconic. So how's the dungeon and town design in this game? Well, it can leave a lot to be desired. Most of the dungeons may not have a map, but the compass in the corner at least makes it easy to know what direction you're going in which if you're using a guide, can make navigating more complex dungeons much easier. When I wasn't using a guide, I sort of just fumbled around until I figured out where to go. I found most dungeons, even most towns, annoying to navigate. Maybe it's just me being bad with directions, but when I think of dungeons and locations in Xenogears, I usually think of the annoying ones before any good ones come to mind. I like most towns at least, with Thames probably being my favorite because of its music and the NPCs. I personally dislike how a lot of the dungeons have a lot of hallways that all look the same. Kislev Sewers, Shavat Hallway Simulator, Krellian's Lab, and the final dungeon are all good examples of confusing and frustrating dungeon design. You may have noticed I left out Babel Tower, well here's a hot take of mine. I don't think Babel Tower was that bad. Sure, the tricky jumps you have to make can be annoying, especially since if you miss them you fall down pretty far, but me personally, I just used save states once it got annoying, and it made it easy for me to make the jumps once I got a few tries. Plus, there isn't that much platforming in the dungeon. It's really not that bad, at least in my opinion. But I think we've talked about gameplay enough, let's talk about the soundtrack composed by the one and only Yasunori Mitsuda. As I'm sure all of you know, the Xenoblade games are very well known for having amazing soundtracks. But what about Xenogears? Well, I think the game's soundtrack is great. Some of my favorites include Bonds of Sea and Fire, The Treasure, which cannot be stolen. Thames, Men of Sea, Shavat, The Wind is Calling, The One Who Is Torn Apart, And of course, one who bears fangs at God. I like pretty much the whole soundtrack, much like the Xenoblade games. The general vibe of the soundtrack is much different, however, with a lot of melancholic slower songs for serious moments in the story and not so many bombastic battle themes. The soundtrack feels like it is from a classic JRPG, probably because of the older sound hardware of the PlayStation, or that is composed by Mitsuda, who has composed music for several other JRPGs at the time. I like the music a lot in this game, but it is not without its issues. 
As stated before, there isn't that many battle themes. There's only one normal enemy encounter theme in this game, and that's it. I personally never got tired of it, however, and believe that it's timeless, but I will fully acknowledge why it may get tiring to listen to after a while. There's also only two boss themes. Night of Fire is played a lot more often than Steel Giant. For a 60 hour game, it feels like there isn't enough variety in songs, so because of this, songs tend to get reused a lot. The soundtrack feels like it is from a classic JRPG, probably because of the older sound hardware of the PlayStation, or that is composed by Mitsuda, who has composed music for several other JRPGs at the time. I like the music a lot in this game, but it is not without its issues. As stated before, there isn't that many battle themes. There's only one normal enemy encounter theme in this game, and that's it. I personally never got tired of it, however, and believe that it's timeless, but I will fully acknowledge why it may get tiring to listen to after a while. There's also only two boss themes. Night of Fire is played a lot more often than Steel Giant. For a 60 hour game, it feels like there isn't enough variety in songs, so because of this, songs tend to get reused a lot. For instance, the song that plays on the Yadrasiel, the pirate sand cruiser, is played so often and is pretty repetitive. Or Omen. While it's a great song, it is played far too much in Disc 2. What makes matters worse is that most dungeons don't have actual dungeon themes. Either you'll be listening to ambient cave noises, which I do actually kind of like personally, or songs that are used in many other scenes in the game, like Infiltration for instance, a song that not only plays when you're infiltrating the castle in Bledovic, the Kislev prison block, in various cutscenes, Solaris Land Dwellers section, and I believe one of the Omni Gear dungeons. As much as I like this soundtrack, it could obviously use some better variety of tracks especially for dungeons, and more battle themes. But I think for what it is, it is quite effective especially for the heavier scenes in the game when a character is having a serious heart-to-heart -heart with another character. I don't think it's fair to compare this to all the Xenoblade games, as it was very different from how these game soundtracks were handled, and back in this time, the Xenogears team did not have the resources Monolith has today. The sound design in this game is pretty stellar as well. The sound effects are pretty charming, especially for death blows. <laughs> There are, however, some annoying sounds like the alarm noise, but other than that, everything else works well and certainly adds to the overall experience. Oh, and I love Franz and his collection of hot sounds. I went to this guy multiple times throughout my playthrough to listen to all of those sick sound effects. As mentioned previously, the style for this game's graphics is the complete opposite from Final Fantasy VII. Rather than pre-rendered backgrounds and primitive 3D character models with fixed cameras, this game uses fully 3D textures for everything. Except the characters and NPCs are all sprites, with gears being 3D models, and full camera control instead of a fixed camera. I may not have played FF7 before, but I find that its graphics have not aged very well. The 3D models were, as mentioned previously, primitive. Xenogears, I feel, has aged much more gracefully. Sure, the textures for each building and landscape in this game aren't anything mind-blowing, but look pretty decent especially for a PlayStation game. And of course, 2D sprites are pretty timeless, and even though you are limited to what you can do with characters' expressions and movement, they did the best they could and did a good job. Oh, and I love the Death Boy animations. Now, I think it's finally time to discuss Xenogear's best part and the reason I played it and never put it down. The story of this game. Let's talk about it. I am going to preface this section of the review by stating that in order to make any sense of what I'm about to talk about, you need to have experienced Xenogears from start to finish in some form or another. 
whether that be playing through the game on original hardware, emulation, or watching a cutscene compilation, I don't care how you experience this game's story, it is just a requirement from this point onward. So yeah, big spoiler warning, go play the game, seriously! If you are a Xenoblade fan, it is a no-brainer to try this game out. Even if you happen to not like Xenoblade all that much, maybe you like a science fiction JRPG with a mature and deep story that will keep you hooked for an entire playthrough. This would be one of the best games to fit that criteria. With that spoiler disclaimer and begging you to play the game out of the way, let's start talking about the game story finally. I feel as though this game starts out very strong. There has often been JRPGs that have somewhat slow starts to them, or even some entries within the Xeno series that take its time to get going, and while sometimes that can work fine, it can make it somewhat challenging to stay invested in the game. Xeno Gears does not have this issue, as the game does a remarkable job keeping you reeled in. Take the first cutscene with Eldridge, for example. This scene makes no sense to a first-time player, but it keeps them wondering throughout the game what relevance it has and its meaning. Once you find out what Eldridge was, it's mind-blowing and recontextualizes various parts of the story. Also, as a side note, when Eldridge was first revealed, it didn't click to me that it was the spaceship from the first cutscene. It took until my second playthrough to connect the dots. Oops. Even if the Eldridge cutscene may not keep you interested, in the first hour or so of the game, you are introduced to Faye and the villagers of Lahan, just for nearly all of the villagers to get killed by Faye's own hands due to it. That whole scene not only does a really good job setting the dark tone of Xenogears, but also will keep the player intrigued for what happens next. With Faye having lost everything, where does he go now? However, I know a main character with amnesia may seem like a somewhat overdone trope by today's standards, and, well, it is, but Faye's particular case of amnesia leads to some of the most interesting development and depth to a JRPG protagonist I have ever seen. With all of this taken into consideration, the beginning of this game is amazing and it sure as heck kept me wanting to play more. After a few adventures into the desert and some fateful encounters later, you meet Bart and his crew. I will save talking about the characters for later, but I do love the NPC dialogue in this game. More importantly, I really like the subtle meta-commentary on Bledovic, the Ave Capital. When you infiltrate the capital to get Margie back, if you go through the libraries within the castle, you'll see that Shakan is trying to rewrite history to his own liking, saying that before he was in charge, the Fatima dynasty was an era of hopelessness and despair, but now that the dynasty is over, life is so much better for everybody. It's a classic case of book burning and trying to rewrite history to fool people into believing a narrative. Commentary like this is great, since sometimes it can closely relate to real-world events even though this is an old game. Once you meet Groff and other antagonists throughout the earlier parts of the game, it only gets more interesting, as you continue to get hints on who Faye is. The scene, Demon of Elru, is one of my favorites in the game and really shows how much power id truly has. But beyond various story beats, what is the meaning behind Xenogears? Well, one of the central themes surrounding this game is finding yourself. Throughout the game, both Faye and Ellie struggle to find a place where they feel they truly belong, one where they feel whole, a place where they're accepted and can feel comfortable instead of hated and oppressed. One of my favorite scenes in particular is the scene after Faye and Ellie escape from the Kislev prison block, where they are drifting throughout the sea, wondering where the waves may take them. This whole speech Faye goes on here is so sad, but also so relatable at the same time. His and Ellie's circumstances are obviously vastly different from that of most real people, but I still feel this scene hits me and many others a certain way and can be very relatable. The game also touches on various other subjects that many JRPGs either don't touch on or only lightly covers them. Particularly, I love the sequence of the game where Billy joins your party and you learn all about the Ethos religious institution, along with the dark side of it with how it all was created for the purpose of taking control of the Earth Dwellers and using them as a middleman to transport slaves to Solaris, how killing the mutant wells was for killing failed human experiments, as well as some of the things the Pontiffs did... Yeah... Needless to say, it's a pretty crazy part of the game, and it touches on subjects that you wouldn't expect it to, and honestly, I feel it is quite ambitious for its time. I also love when you visit Shavat. The journey up to Shavat may have been frustrating at times, but once you're up there, it's great. I love Shavat. The music and general atmosphere here is fantastic, as well as the story. 
I love the character arc with Maria and her father, Nikolai. It shows more of the horrors of Solaris, what the Gazelle Ministry and Kremlin are capable of, but also shows that not all hope is lost and that we can move on from all the horrors that have happened. Though, I'll be honest, I did not particularly like the part when Choo Choo transformed into Big Choo Choo and destroyed Nikolai. It was a little silly, for a game where it's so serious in tone, I know it's good to have funny moments in games to mix things up a little, but it felt very out of place, and Choo Choo isn't a great comic relief character anyways, Bart already covers that pretty well. Beyond that, I love when Bart and Margie go through the underground chambers in Nissan to stop Shakan. There's plenty of humor here, but also plenty of serious moments, and it is fantastic to finally see Bart get his throne back after all this time. Also, just gonna quickly mention this funny line from Saiten, indeed, the mirror does reflect things. Anyways, when you finally make it to Solaris, it's as bad as we thought it was. People are pretty brainwashed here, and if they complain, they presumably get killed. Even though I do enjoy the commentary I play here with that Takahashi put in this game, I guess it could have been a little less, um, blunt, I suppose? Or maybe extreme would be the right word. Nevertheless, I still enjoy it. Once you reach Krellian's lab, there are so many wells here locked up it's pretty unfortunate, but I think one of the most disturbing depictions is next up. Saiten does a funny and lets Faye and Ellie eat this canned food in the lab, but soon after they find out what the canned food is. The information is revealed slowly, but it turns out they were taken wells, using machines to crush their bodies to turn them into canned food they can feed to the people of Solaris. That's right, it's cannibalism! Even though it's pretty gross and haunting, especially with the screams, it does a great job depicting how there is no depth to how Krellian and the Gazelle Ministry will go. Also, Saiten, what the heck? Anyways, our good friend Hammer does some really cool stuff here at the end of Disc 1. We will discuss this later, trust me. I love how the memory cubes, the save points in this game, are directly tied to the plot and are used by the Gazelle Ministry to track where Faye and the others are and what they are doing. It not only demonstrates just how much power Solaris has over the world, but makes great use of an otherwise commonly used function within JRPGs that don't serve any plot relevance. I love how Disc 1 concludes. It ends with so much uncertainty, with Faye and Ellie at the brink of death, with Groff watching over them, and also an end to Entronach, the capital of Solaris, because it reawakens and destroys it. Oh, I nearly forgot, this is also where the game finally reveals that Faye has schizophrenia. Granted, pretty much everyone already knows that, but I believe they were trying not to hide it, as there was a lot of build-up to this scene where everything gets explained. This and Saiten interrogating it are some of my favorite moments within Disc 1, but with that, we move on to Disc 2, one of the more divisive parts of the game. Finally, we've moved on to Disc 2, and boy there is a lot to discuss. Firstly, let's discuss the elephant in the room, the chair scenes. So as I've mentioned before, Xenogears had many development troubles, so in order to finish the game on time without cutting the story short on Disc 1, which would have been a horrible choice by the way, they had to sacrifice some potential boss fights and major scenes. So instead of going through the game like before, we now have many major plot details read to us by main characters sitting in a chair while walls of text go by, with this cross going back and forth and all. Do I think this was poorly handled? No actually. I firmly believe they did a good job with what little resources and time they had. It is a little jarring, but it works well enough, and a good amount of the important scenes do play out like normal. But yes, it can get a little tiring to see the chair and text boxes for much of Disc 2. But really, there's only like two dungeons in Disc 2, so it's not very long. In my playthrough, it took me 50 hours to clear Disc 1, and Disc 2 only took 10. Even though it may seem a little unusual, Disc 2 is short enough that I don't really think it's a huge deal. But that's just my opinion. Disc 2 raises the stakes more and more, with many of the Earth Dwellers turning into wells due to Deus' resurrection, as well as the infamous cross scene, and much of the world being destroyed when Makarva appears. By the end of the game, it is truly the last hope for humanity, as many have already died. It's fantastically put together, and makes the end of the game all the more exciting. Before the final dungeon, I'd like to bring up the Zeboim side quest which I found very interesting. The whole backstory with Kim and Emeralda and Zeboim is so interesting. I love all the lore surrounding it, with even Mion being there to pull the strings to eventually bring Deus back. I do wish they went into a little more detail with this, but I understand, development was a mess. Big Joe's backstory is fantastic, but again, I will get into that later. 
If there was ever a remake of this game, I do hope more is covered with Zeboim and maybe other Fey and Ellie reincarnations. But with that said, let's discuss Disc 2's actual problem. The Final Dungeon Whoever designed this, please, why did you do this? This is one of the most confusing and poorly designed Final Dungeons I have ever seen. Just to make it clear, it is REQUIRED to have a guide for Merkava. If you don't, you are going to be in a world of pain and frustration, because the game hints at the lasers you need to activate in order to progress, but has no hints as to how to get there. It's all a huge network of tunnels and hallways that all look the same. If this was created to extend playtime by another 5 hours or so, then good job, you succeeded! Never do this again. Even with a guide, this dungeon is annoying. You want to run away from most random encounters as they cost fuel and it's pretty much a waste of time even if you aren't at a high level. I was around level 65 when I beat the game, so level requirements aren't much of an issue. It's mostly about your gear's equipment. And if you manage to afford Big Joe's overpowered endgame equipment, then this should be more or less a cakewalk. The last few boss fights aren't too difficult, though you need to manage your party members' fuel on their gears carefully as there are 5 boss fights you need to clear here. Deus can be tough, but I didn't have too much of an issue once I've reached it. Ouroboros, on the other hand, is a joke, but hey, final boss theme is great. Speaking of the final boss, this sequence here where Faye and Krellian have a conversation about humans and god is so interesting. It's truly what Xenogears is all about. It's philosophy on human nature, god, and the profound connection between Faye and Ellie. It's just so good. It's kind of a shame the boss fight itself is a joke, but I still absolutely love this scene. The animated scenes later on, however, especially the ones that involve trying to convince Krillian to come back, are flawed to say the least, but I will discuss that later. As for the final cutscene with Faye and Ellie returning to the planet, it's great, though with some pretty dated voice acting and animation. Still, it's a great ending to a fantastic story that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Oh, and the credits theme, Small Two Pieces, is so good. Give it a listen. But yeah, that's my thoughts on the game's story as well as some of the dungeons. Great game, but I avoided giving my thoughts on the characters because the next part of my video will go over each of them in detail, so here we go! Now, let's talk about the characters. This game has a wonderful cast of characters, maybe even too many. There's a total of 9 playable characters, many side characters, and a number of villains too. I'm going to go over my thoughts of each character in that order, so let's get on with it. The protagonist, Fei Fan Wan, or should I say, one of the protagonists, is, in my opinion, one of the best JRPG protagonists of all time. But why do I feel this way about this character? To put it simply, he defied my expectations. In Lahan Village, I didn't find him too interesting, especially since he had a especially cliché JRPG trope of a guy with amnesia, and keep in mind, I did not think this game was going to be anything too special when I started, but I was wrong. Very wrong, in fact. Not only was his past incredibly intriguing and well executed, but he also grows so much over the course of the story. His initial grief, as previously stated, was understandable, as he had lost everything he had since he awoke with amnesia, he just didn't know how to cope with what had happened. But over time, he meets new people, joins Bart and the crew, and finds purpose in life. He is always just wandering, trying to find a place to belong, which is one of his main character arcs, and that resonated with me greatly. It also helps that he has a number of witty lines that I enjoyed reading, but most of all, his dissociative identity disorder. Id is so interesting. The game gives you a ton of hints towards it being Fey, and when it is all eventually revealed, it is very obvious at that point, but that's okay. I don't think they were trying to hide that Fey has multiple personalities, I feel the writers wanted to show its strength and how unhinged he can really be when awakened. And it is demonstrated multiple times with some key scenes in a boss fight. But beyond id, there is more than just that. There's the coward too, who only knows of the positive memories from childhood, what makes all of this make sense is the traumatic experiences Faye had as a child, with all of the horrible experiments done to him and other humans, and how Khan refused to acknowledge that Faye was telling the truth about the experiments. All of it makes sense for how it could happen to someone. Along with being the contact, that is where the superhuman powers of id come from. 
I just find it all so interesting and complex, but it doesn't even stop there. As already stated, Faye is able to contact, thus he has the power to destroy the Zohar, which is required to free the world from Deus. So throughout history, there are reincarnations of Abel and I just find them so interesting. I love the past with Kim Kasim and Zeboim. We don't see much of it, but what we do get is a genius who learns of nanotechnology and creates Emeralda, which you get as a party member later on. I just wish they told us more about Zeboim, I love the concept of a huge underground city like this. And then there's Lacan, who is so similar to Faye in a lot of ways. I love the painting of Sophia he does, the meaning behind it being so tragic just makes it so interesting. Lacan and Krellian being on good terms is so cool, especially since we see exactly why both Krellian and Lacan fell into never-ending pits of despair and hatred. With Krellian becoming devoid of any humanity, only wishing to become one with God and leave this planet by any means necessary, and Lacan becoming Groth. It's just, I don't know the words of it. It's just, there's so much going on with this character and it all ties together so nicely. Look, I may love Shulk and Rex as protagonist, but I'm sorry, they do not even hold a candle to Faye Fon Wan. Ellie is very similar to Faye. Both go through many of the same trials and tribulations, they both have a mutual love for each other, and both are reincarnations of some of the first humans to be born on this planet. However, they fulfill somewhat different roles in the story. What I mean by this is that throughout the reincarnation flashbacks, and even some of the later scenes in the game, Ellie takes on the, I guess you could call, motherly role, being there to take care of the sick and wounded, her being titled Mother Sophia, and leading Nissan, and so on. But beyond that, there are also scenes where she isn't taken seriously as a lieutenant because she is a woman. And even though this does a good job of illustrating sexism within the army, let's be real, even Faye is sexist at times and it's not great. I firmly believe that you cannot have one without the other. If one was removed from the story, you wouldn't have Xenogears. But what do I think of their relationship? On one hand, there are many heartwarming and heartbreaking moments throughout the course of their relationship, and in terms of canon ships across the series, I find theirs to be a lot more compelling than others. But this does not mean I do not have issues with it. For one, I dislike how much she is idolized by Faye and Krellian. She may be a very important person to many within Nissan, but at the end of the day, she is just a normal woman in unique circumstances. The fact that Sophia Dyan drives both Krellian and Lacan to commit such atrocities and fall into such depths of anger and resentment is, well, very unhealthy. Not only that, but if we are talking about their latest reincarnations, the whole scene with Faye telling her not to go to Mahanan, it just doesn't really sit right with me. But on the other hand, the idolization of Sophia and what comes after does a great job in showing what happens when you do become obsessed with another human being, when you can't bear the thought of them leaving. It tackles the subject head-on and illustrates some of the worst occurrences that may happen when struck with so much grief. So at the end of the day, how do I feel about Faye and Ellie's relationship? I actually really like it, with the exceptions listed above, but just like all relationships, they don't come without problems or disagreements, and the general philosophy at play here made it special, which I'd hope was done well since this is one of Xenogear's main themes it focuses on. As for my thoughts on Ellie as a character, she's great and I like her just as much as Faye. I consider her somewhat of a protagonist herself, even if you don't see everything from her perspective. Saiten is… weird. Really weird. But he is also iconic. Why is that? Well, for starters, he likes to tinker with his junk in the backyard works for Emperor Kane on a secret mission, is a certified doctor, has incredible martial arts skills and swordmanship, and <clears throat> knows a little more about the world than most do. Saiten is one of the most interesting characters in the game. Throughout the story, it is hard to tell where his true motives lie and whether or not he's even trustworthy. On top of this, he goes on long tangents often and says a number of lines that just don't make any sense. And at one point, he even betrays Faye for a few minutes. When his betrayal happened, it wasn't exactly mind-blowing, which is fine, since the true reason for doing that was to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of, if not the most dangerous being alive, id. But despite all of his amazing moments in the story, he has his own share of issues. For instance, the scene I mentioned earlier when Faye and Ellie eat the canned food made up of human flesh and meat, well, Saiten just lets them chow down on it, though he rejects the food, understandably, 
He never advises them not to eat it despite being aware of its contents, which on one hand is a little funny, but on the other is just such a crappy thing to do. With all of that said, Saiten is one of my favorite characters. He may be strange, he may even be annoying at times, but he is a genius and has vast knowledge of what is really going on in the world, alongside numerous impressive skill sets. Really, there's no one quite like Saiten, and even though future Xenogames may have tried to live up to him, I'm not sure if they really did hit the same as the original. Let's be real, who doesn't like Bart? He is such a lovable me-head, but even he can be philosophical and interesting, albeit a little silly at times, especially during the Bart Missile segment. I love his dynamic with Faye, and really all of the characters he interacts with. He has so many funny moments, but also at times can be taken seriously, especially later on. I love how he treats his crew, and I enjoy him and Sigurd's friendship, and really, he is a very enjoyable character who goes through a lot. I like his storyline with reclaiming the throne. The build-up to it is fantastic, it may take more than one attempt, and mistakes may have been made before getting there, but he does it eventually. And what makes him all the more interesting is his decision to abandon the throne and instead make it a republic. It makes sense with him just not having the time to deal with leading a country, nor really wanting to, especially with Solaris needing to be dealt with. But yeah, overall, great character. One of the saving graces to the Kislev prison section is Rico. Not only is he incredibly strong, but led an incredibly sad life. I find his backstory to be really well done. With him being related to the Kaiser, without him being aware, just makes it so interesting. It's really quite sad when you find out that his mom resented him when he started to take after his father. Growing demi-human features caused her to hate him, and unfortunately, she treated him like dirt due to the way he looked, so yeah, textbook racism. But despite the great backstory, after the Kiss of Prison section of the game, he is no longer really relevant to the story, with only a few quips here and there, and that's about it. Like a number of the main party members, he is one of those characters where you meet him, you witness his character arc, and then he gets cast to the sidelines. It's unfortunate, but he is still cool nonetheless. Despite having a somewhat silly western name, Billy, specifically his character arc surrounding the ethos, is one of my favorite segments in the game. His backstory involving his mother getting killed by Wells and his father disappearing to deal with Solaris, him and his traumatized sister having to live alone with Billy contemplating selling his own body to survive is just absolutely abhorrent, and you have to wonder how he even managed. Ethos was one of his gateways to salvation, and when it is shown how much corruption and horrors are underneath the guise of faith in God, it is no wonder Billy has a hard time grasping the truth once he found out. In my opinion, it is one of the most raw moments in a JRPG, with how it's not even dancing around dark subjects, or straight up calling religious authorities into question. It's just fantastic. And when you see Isaac Stone dying by Billy and Josiah's hands, it is so, so satisfying. Many other JRPGs involve killing God one way or another, or taking down corrupt religious institutions, but this game takes it up to 100 and I love it for that. It makes it stand out, even when compared to the Xenoblade games. But, like last time, Billy suffers the same fate that Rico suffered. After the events of Ethos, Billy's plot relevance fades away, and he sits at the sidelines along with the others. Still, like Rico, I absolutely love his character growth, especially his relationship with his father, Jesse. When he comes back after a long absence, Billy is, understandably, angry, but after everything with the Ethos and Isaac Stone happens, he grows to appreciate his father once again, and even with the dark undertones, his character arc gets a very deserved happy ending. Maria is a solid character with an interesting backstory with her father Nikolai and her dear Siebzen. Maria's backstory with Nikolai is yet again another sad one, with Nikolai himself coming to attack Shavat, this time within the form of a human infused with gear, whose will is only to destroy. A terrifying creation based on experiments, Nikolai was forced into the cruel and heartless Solaris higher-ups. When Maria, understandably, cannot fight her own father, Choo Choo gives her support, I guess you could call it. Then she runs to Sieb Zen's hangar to get on it and go fight her father. She struggles to take out her own father, understandably, but Nikolai modifies Sieb Zen to respond to his spirit when nearby so it can destroy him. It is a very tragic scene, but a great one. Just wish the tunnel whiplash with Choo Choo wasn't there. Speaking of Choo Choo... So... About Choo Choo... 
Yep. I don't like Choo Choo very much. Groff, the Seeker of Power. There was a lot to go over with this guy. When you bear witness to him the first time around, he gives you the vibes of a stereotypical evil guy for the sake of being evil kind of villain. And he does remain that way for a long time, frequently showing up out of nowhere to power up an enemy you're about to fight but in battle just to make life harder for Faye, I suppose. Once you reach the end of the game, there is so much more to this character than meets the eye, and because of that, he is one of my favorite villains in the series. For starters, his past as Lacan, one of the reincarnations of Abel, is so interesting. His friendship he once had with Krellian, his relationship with Sophia, as well as Roni and Rene Fatima. But what makes him so great is he may be a villain looking to kill God, but in a way he guides Faye towards saving humanity from Deus. All those times he chimes in to power up various foes that stand in Faye's way feels like a test of strength to see how strong he is, or tests he must overcome to become stronger and eventually destroy Deus. On one hand, you could think that he only does this to gauge how strong he is so then he can merge with Faye to become the ultimate life form capable of destroying humanity and Deus, or you could think of it as a way to help Faye become stronger so then he can save the world from certain destruction by Deus. When you find out Groff actually possesses Wise Men, who is Khan Wan, Faye's father, it all makes sense. This could be a little off the mark, but I feel Khan had some control over Groff throughout his possession and used that to guide Faye in the right direction. Or maybe it could have something to do with Groff being Lacan, who is the contact and technically has the same body as Faye. There are so many ways to interpret Groff, but the main point is, is that Groff gives you that original feeling of being a one-note type villain to being a character with a deep backstory and motivations. Another reason to believe this to be true is there are times where he just watches over Faye. For instance, at the end of Disc 1, you see him standing there watching over Faye and Ellie struggle to stay alive after their deadly encounter with Ramses. But what really seals the deal is that at the end, Groff sacrifices himself to temporarily stop the Zohar from causing certain destruction by merging with it. And that is why I find him to be such a great villain. The sussy boy Ramses is great. His main ambition is to kill Faye, since when he was a child, he was told that he was a reject and useless. The way he gets treated by Krellian and Mian at the end is horrible, and they deserve what was coming to them. He goes from being desperate for any source of power to kill Faye, to feeling miserable due to his inability to kill him, to eventually, at the end of the game, being told by Saiten and the elements that he isn't trash or a reject, and that he is in fact very important to many people and is not useless. I love his character development throughout the game, and I also enjoyed his backstory with Saiten and Sigurd. They both saw him as a glimmer of hope for Solaris, but ultimately, he didn't live up to their expectations. Despite this, he was also in difficult circumstances with Solaris with how much control Krellian and Mion had over him, so part of me is not sure how he could have improved people's material conditions within Solaris. With everything just said though, I am happy he ended up surviving until the end. He deserved redemption despite what he has done. Mion is an absolutely terrifying villain. She is so conniving, and the fact that she is always there, possessing someone's body is just insane. When I think of Mion, the first scene that comes to mind is in Disc 2 when she dies, then possesses Ellie and shoots Faye. Just an absolutely shocking scene that does leave you confused as to why this happened, and how she was the woman at the beginning cutscene who was overlooking the ocean on the planet Eldridge Crash landed on. With Ellie being the anti-type who was created by Abel, aka the Contact, who were both assigned by the Wave Existence to eventually destroy Deus, Mion's sole purpose was to resurrect Deus and go through the effort of furthering human evolution so then humans could be appropriate parts for Deus's resurrection, and she fulfilled that role to a T. She had a hand in halting Kim's nanotechnology research as well, as causing Fate to undergo all the horrific experiments that was done on him to awaken his powers. And we're not even done! She originally called Ramses a reject in the beginning, which haunted him for the rest of his life. So is Mion a good villain? Hell yes she is, and she is a terrifying one at that. Other than my explanation that I just did, she has a few iconic lines here and there, and some interesting moments. All in all, another great villain to add to the lineup whose role is extremely important to the story. Last, and certainly not least, is Krellian, or Carolyn, depending on which translation you prefer. Krellian is a villain who does unspeakable horrors in the name of resurrecting God and leaving the planet behind to live with it. As mentioned before, the reason he does what he does in the first place is because of Sophia dying in the Solaris War. 
He wonders if God even exists, and then swears to create God himself, to which his plan shifted over time. When he learns about the true nature of Deus, he then decides to use Deus' resurrection as a tool to reunite with the wave existence so then he can return humanity back to its true form in waves, a form of non-existence. He is fully aware that everything he's done has all been horrific, but he justifies this to himself by claiming this is all to return to the wave existence, which is his own twisted way of saving humanity. As a villain and as a character to analyze, there is a lot going on here. I find him to be very interesting, and his plights on God even existing when a loved one, Sophia, dies, can be relatable to some. But despite me really enjoying him as a character, the end of Disc 2 sort of falls flat on its face with regards to him. At the end, after Ouroboros is defeated, Faye and Ellie attempt to convince Krellian to come back to Earth, despite everything that he has done. He refuses, of course, since he doesn't believe he deserves salvation after everything he's done, which is correct, by the way. The reason I do not like this interaction is because, in a way, it's sort of a poor attempt to make the player feel bad for Krellian, and to give him some sympathy. Sure, he is aware and has admitted to his wrongdoings, however, that is in no way absolves him of any of his actions. So it's hard to imagine this last-ditch effort to turn Krellian into a tragic villain really works out in any way. Other than that rather strange interaction, I do like the send-off for his character with him accepting his fate, and of course the ending to the game is excellent. But what of the other villains? Most of the other villains of this game are fairly minor and are only around for a limited amount of time. That, and I haven't really mentioned any of the non-playable side characters yet, so let's do sort of a lightning round for the side characters. So let's talk side characters. There's a ton of them, so let's just get started. Sorry if I leave out some of your favorites, I'm mostly going to stick with the ones I found worth bringing up. Starting with Big Joe. As mentioned previously, I love his past with Zeboam, and how he's even still around at all. That and his random appearances throughout the game are iconic. I love the fight against him in the battle and tournament, as well as his final appearance in the Zeboam ruins. He's just one of those NPCs that leaves an impression. The Captain of Thames. Okay, not only does he have some iconic lines, but his theme is just so good. It gets stuck in my head all the time, even now. His personality is silly yet charismatic, his Men of the Sea quote is iconic, and I just love every moment with him on screen, especially when he seemingly returns from the dead at the end of disc 2. Now let's talk about the elements. Dominia is pretty headstrong and prefers not to listen to reason, but you know what, she seems alright. The other elements, most notably Talon and Seraphita, are comedy gold. Other than that, not much to say about them. They care a lot about Ramses though. Dan is an enigma. He has a rather strange design, has some dumb lines in Lahan, and then hates Faye for a very long time, until eventually, he comes to understand what really happened when he sees Faye awaken into id. An annoying kid to be sure, but yet a reminder of what happened to Lahan at the beginning. Now let's talk about an NPC that's not so great, Hammer. Oh, Hammer. I didn't actually mind him too much at first, but over time he just got more and more annoying, especially how he's always like, hey, buy more stuff from my shop, bro! But what really gets me is that scene. When he shoots Medina, I just about lost it. When he comes back as a machine fusion, I just do not care. Plus his boss fight is really annoying. When he dies, I honestly felt no remorse. Hammer sucks. A lot. Nothing but a coward. Oh, and Ellie's parents seemed nice, but her dad seemed to have abusive tendencies. Next is Isaac Stone. This guy can die in the deepest, darkest recesses of hell, and even then, it wouldn't be a good enough punishment. Jesse seems like a cool dad with some problems. Oh boy, Margie. Alright, so I think she's cool, but my god, I do not like some of the implications surrounding her and Bart. They are cousins, come on. Definitely a part of Xenogers that I don't care for at all. Sigurd is awesome and I enjoy him and Bart's interactions. As a side note, at first I thought Sigurd was a woman since his gender was never specified, and in all honesty, I was disappointed when I found out he wasn't, because man, Yudrasil feels like a sausage fest sometimes. Zephyr seems like a cool leader of Shavat with a past similar to many others who have lived experience with the Solaris War. And I believe that's all the side characters I wanted to mention. So next, let's get to talking about a wonderful piece of literature that accompanies Xenogears well, known as Perfect Works, The Real Thing. If you played through Xenogears, you need to read through Perfect Works. There are easily accessible PDFs online you can find of it translated into English. 
After reading through it, I came to understand Takahashi's original vision much more, and that Xenogears was just a small part of a much larger story to tell. The first pages of the book explains the timeline and what Xenogears Episode 5 even meant. It is very interesting, and I highly recommend giving it a good read. Much of the book revolves around explaining certain details that weren't in the game originally, such as characters' sense? And all around, it complements Xenogears very well. But is this book relevant to anything Xeno related today? Wasn't Takahashi's vision put to a steep halt when Squaresoft's executive said no to Greenlight in a Xenogears sequel? Well, since this video is just on Xenogears, I'd rather not speak too much about Perfect Works' relation to the newer Xeno releases. All I'll say is this. Once you read Perfect Works, you can connect the dots fairly easily. People have said in the past that Xenogears, Xenosaga, and Xenoblade are all completely separate and have nothing to do with each other. But I'd go on a limb here and say that those people don't really know what they're talking about. Takahashi has been meaning to continue his original vision since the day Monolith Soft has found it. It's just that his original plans took a much different course than anticipated, and that he had to shift ideas around in order to make it work. Now that Xenoblade 3 is coming out in a few days, it's looking like this could finally be Episode 6 of Xenogears, or maybe just another retelling of Episode 5. Either way, I am excited, and so should you. So yeah, read Perfect Works, but most importantly, play Xenogears if you haven't. So that concludes my Xenogears review. What a start! I've said this already, but playing Xenogears is integral to gaining a much deeper understanding of this wonderful series. Your appreciation of the series, especially the Xenoblade games, will increase by tenfold if you go back and play Gears and Saga, but really, you already knew that, didn't you? How do I feel about Xenogears as a whole, though? I believe Xenogears to be one of the most ambitious and fascinating pieces of game in history. Sure, its gameplay may not hold up to some, and maybe Disc 2's visual novel-esque format may be jarring, but underneath some of its flaws is a game that is truly one of a kind. The story and characters are just so well thought out, especially the villains. Its complex nature is part of what makes it interesting. It's a mature and dark story, and it goes places where many JRPGs shy away from going. Its soundtrack, although repetitive at times, is very stellar, and its art style has not aged poorly over time, either. Is Xenogears my favorite Xeno game, or more importantly, is it my favorite game of all time? At this moment in time, it is. However, that could change. I have not finished Xenosaga Episode 1 yet, and again, Xenoblade 3 is coming very soon. From what I've heard, Xenosaga Episodes 1, 2, 3 is another incredibly compelling story with amazing character writing. So guess what game I'll review next in the series? Xenosaga Episode 1. It may not be for a long time, but I will get to it eventually, and I will also review the Xenoblade titles, but again, it will be a long while until I get to that. I hope you enjoyed my Xenogears review. Make sure to follow me on Twitter and subscribe to my channel. I'd love to hear your feedback on this video, it took far too long to make. It took a long time to figure out how I was going to structure my review, and my god, I had to redo the story section of this review about five times I'm pretty sure. It was not easy, but I am beyond happy I finally got this massive project finished. Completely off topic, but while I was working on this video, I watched through both Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Both of these shows are so good, if you haven't seen them, go watch them, they are peak fiction. With all that said, see you next time. Don't